Okay, thanks very much for inviting me here. Um, I'll, uh, I've kind of organized my talk into different bits. So I'll go through these sections, me and my project, some history, the events from September the 14th to February the 11th, um, the event and its reception. You know, this is the discovery of gravitational waves, the first confirmed detection of gravitational waves announced at a press conference on February the 11th, 2016. But the actual event was seen on September the 15th, 2015. And a few more things at the end, which are some of which might be quite interesting. And I'll head each of the sections with this, so we'll see how we're getting along. I'll try and talk for about 30 minutes and leave plenty of time for questions and answers, because there usually are various questions. So let's start with me and my project. Um, it's actually, I've been doing this for, I think it is the 45th year, not 30th year. At least I started in 1972. Those were the first interviews I conducted on what was then the controversy over gravitational waves. I'll talk a bit there, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. And these are the, some of the books. Gravity's Shadow, which is a very thick book. It's about over 800 pages long, nearly 900 pages. Um, which was published in 2004. My advice is not to buy it because once you start reading it, you'll never put it down and it will waste a lot of your time. <laughs> and the second, that, that book, Gravity's Ghost, is actually two books in one. One's, one book is called Gravity's Ghost, which was originally published separately by itself. And then the second book was called Big Dog, and I persuaded the publishers to include Gravity's Ghost in the publication of Big Dog. So this book is the paperback version of Gravity's Ghost, as well as being the paperback version of Big Dog. There was never a hardback version of it. And what that book describes is two so-called blind injections, which is, this is when the big interferometric gravitational wave detectors were in business. I'll explain that in a moment. And what the scientists did was get a small group, two or three people, to inject into the interferometers a signal which looked like a gravitational wave and keep it secret. So that the whole community had to investigate this signal not knowing whether it was a real signal or a fake signal. So they were rehearsing for the detection of a real signal not knowing whether they were already looking at a real signal to make it as valid as possible. One of the things that the book talks about a lot is whether these blind injections were really mimicking a real detection of gravitational waves, because now we had the real detection of gravitational waves. The book, this book, is a real-time account from the evening of September the 15th, 2015, when I was first read the email that said interesting event has happened to, you know, for about six months until the thing was out in public and then it goes on about the reception of it in public and so forth. It's all written in real time, or mostly in real time anyway. I didn't start writing it until the event happened on a Monday and I didn't start writing the book until the Thursday because I assumed it wasn't a real event, just like every, all the other scientists did as well. You know, they thought it was another bit of noise. Uh, but then it grew rapidly in credibility over about two days. And then I realized, hey, this is something interesting going on here. And I started to write on the Thursday, um, have, just having um, collected the emails up till then. And, it was obviously interesting from the word go to collect, be worth collecting the emails, which I did. Incidentally, just so you, I'll tell you how I wrote this book. I mean, I've been at this for donkey's years, as you see, and my method is mostly to initially to interview the scientists. I went, in 1972, I drove across America in an old car talking to all the scientists who were involved in gravitational wave detection. And then from the... Uh, mid-90s to the mid-2000s, I went to every single gravitational wave conference that took place around the world and got to know the gravitational wave scientists really well. 
I mean, one of the very senior people was staying with us for the weekend, just last weekend, actually, because we'd become friends. And uh, then, uh, mm -hmm. but, and so I did an awful lot of traveling, use an awful lot of air miles, enough air miles to travel business class wherever I went for about 10 years because I had all these air miles. Can't do it anymore, unfortunately. Um, and uh, so I was going to maybe six, seven international meetings a year across the world. Uh, but this event, I assumed was going to involve me in a hell of a lot of airplane travel, but it didn't because the whole thing happened over email. Emails, a few telecons, a few telephone calls. Obviously, people were talking to each other in their local groups. Remember, this is a group of uh, 1,200 people scattered around the world, and they did not at any time during the course of this discovery meet together in one place. They did it all by email and by telecom. And I was just sitting in the middle of this web of emails and telecoms, collecting them. Um, now, the question is, why on earth, why me? You want to know, if you want to know something about the detection of gravitational waves, why have you invited a sociologist? I'm a sociologist, for heaven's sake. Okay. And this is a fairly serious question for me, too. Am I capable of writing about the detection of gravitational waves? And the answer is yes. Uh, and, but I'm going to justify this a little bit more than I might normally. Let me say one justification is that when I write stuff, I send it to the gravitational wave physicists and say, read this and tell me if there's anything wrong with it. And I've never had any serious problems. Well, you know, we have a few arguments. You know, you're saying that about us, Harry, that's not true. And I say, well, I think it is true. And we argue backwards and forwards. And generally, when I have a serious conversation like that, I'll alter maybe half of what I've, half of the points that they object to and leave the other half as they were. That's the kind of way it goes. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about why it is that I am capable of writing this book because I think one of the tests I did is partic of particular interest to you guys. Uh, and there you are, there's a piece in Nature, Sociologist Fools Physics Judges, that's me, I'm the sociologist. And, uh, I did it by playing imitation games, which of course are the forerunner of the Turing test. So I thought you might be slightly interested in these. And what this Nature article is reporting is something we did in 2005 stroke six, where I got a gravitational wave physicist from my university department in Cardiff. They, this, Cardiff is by coincidence, I should, by complete coincidence quite a big place for gravitational wave physics. So I've got one of the guys from there, a professor from there, to ask some questions of me and a gravitational wave physicist. And then we had three dialogues, you know, me, the question there, the answer from respondent A there, the answer from respondent B there. This was sent to nine other gravitational wave physicists. They were technical questions. And the nine other gravitational wave physicists was, were asked, which one's the real gravitational wave physicist? Uh, we've done a lot in Cardiff. We, we, me and my group have done a lot more imitation games since. Incidentally, we got a, a very nice two and a quarter million European Research Council advance grant to use imitation games as a new so, social science method. And we're just writing a book about imitation games for MIT Press. Uh, and then we repeated this experiment. Those are the questions, wait a minute, let me just, sorry. We repeated the experiments. These are the results for some much more recent versions of it in 2016. If you want to know what the questions were like, I've given you the 2016 questions. Don't bother to read through all those eight questions. Just pick one or two at random. So you get a sense of the nature of the questions being asked. This wasn't trivial stuff. OK, this was qu quite a reasonably hard test. Same professor of physics at Cardiff asked those questions. OK, and here's the results of that test. So uh, on the left-hand side of the table, you see the, the question is, we, this time we elaborated. We got not just me, but other people to answer the questions, as, not just me and a gravitational wave physicist. We got three gravitational wave physicists to answer the questions. We got what I call three savvy physicists to answer the questions. Now, savvy physicists are 
astrophysicists working in the same department, Cardiff department, as the gravitational wave physicists. So they knew a lot about gravitational waves from working in the same department as well as being astrophysicists themselves. Two savvy social scientists, and savvy social scientists are people like my junior colleagues at Cardiff who have to read everything I ever write and listen to me talking, you know, at enormous length about gravitational wave physics. So they know quite a bit about it as well. And me, Harry Collins. And then on the right, we got, on the, going across the top, you see the people who marked the answers. The people who marked the answers were another four gravitational wave physicists, four different ones entirely. Okay, the, two, the same two savvy social scientists. Um, you may, it may have already struck you that there's a problem here because there are people marking their own answers. But actually, it was much of, it's less of a problem than you think because the marking was done a long time after the questions were being asked. And there's 72 randomly ordered questions and it's not actually so easy to recognize which question you'd answered. So it's a little bit messy, but it's not too bad. Okay, two ordinary social scientists who knew nothing about gravitational wave physicists especially because they weren't under my control and me myself. So uh, the first thing to look down is the left hand column and you'll see the way the four gravitational wave physicists, you could get a maximum of 32 points incidentally if you answered every question right. And I got the, gra other, the three other gravitational wave physicists got an average of 27 points and I got 25 points which isn't bad. Whereas the non-gravitational wave physicists, crucially, including the savvy physicists who didn't know anything about gravitational waves, got considerably less points. And there's an interesting lesson in this very little small experiment, which is that expertises are like crevasses. They're very narrow and deep. And it's not the case that if you're a scientist in a white coat, you can go up and pronounce authoritatively on any similar subject that's close to yours. And this little tiny experiment shows it. And even a snotty-nosed sociologist like me can do better in answering those questions than a physicist who's been spent a lot of time near to other gravitational wave physicists. Well, there's more in that table. We can come back to it in the question session if you want, but I don't want to spend a whole lecture on that. So some history of this, the first person to have tried to detect gravitational waves, Einstein invented uh, or th worked out that these were a consequence of the theory of relativity in the early uh, 20th century. He worked out what the kind of, not the waveform, but more, some of their properties when he worked out the general theory of relativity in 1915. Uh, the detection, which was in 2015, was miraculously just 100 years after Einstein had come up with a detailed idea. Uh, but the first person to try and detect them was Joe Weber, this guy here, shown here, who started to try and detect them in the, in the early 60s with a device like this. That thing he's working on is a cylinder of aluminium weighing a tonne and a half or a couple of tonnes suspended, insulated in a vacuum tube. It has piezoelectric crystals glued to its surface which will sense any slight vibration in the, uh, in the cylinder. And the trick is to have two of these cylinders a couple of thousand miles apart and look for coincident excitations in the two cylinders. And what you say is if this happens, if, there, if, if you've eliminated all sources of vibration in the cylinders. You can't. They're always jiggling about from Brownian motion and residual vibrations coming up through the earth that you hadn't quite managed to damp out and residual 60 mains frequency and things like that's coming through the electrical system. But if you can eliminate most of that stuff and then you see a couple of big excursions happening at exactly the same time or to be more exact within the light travel time between the two 2,000 miles an hour detectors, okay, you, can, you say, well, I, I can't think what could have caused this, so we'll call that gravitational waves. Okay, well, you, you can think of some things that could have caused it. If you get a lightning strike somewhere in between the two detectors, well, they could cause it. And the other thing that, the sort of thing that people used to worry about is, what if you, this happens on Monday night in America, when everybody's watching Monday night football and at the interval they all get up and switch their kettle, kettles on, that's going to send a 
pulse through the grid at exactly the same time and that could fool you. You might think that's a gravity wave. But so you wipe out all that sort of stuff and you try and measure all that sort of stuff and you try and get to a gravitational wave. Um, that's a schematic of Joe's uh, Weber's design. Uh, another half dozen people tried to repeat Joe Weber's findings uh, pretty well completely. They didn't confirm it. And that's when I come in in 1972 going around interviewing both lots of scientists and trying to work out how they argue with each other and how they come to a conclusion. But that was my earliest work. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, let's see that. So with that technology, which was improved, they, the next generation of these resonant bars was cooled down to near ab absolute zero. Uh, they're quite difficult. But so Joe Weber's apparatus must have cost a few tens of thousands of dollars and then you're getting into the hundreds of thousands of dollars with the cryogenically cooled bars. Uh, big centers of this were Italy uh, as well as the United States. And over the period up to the early 2000s, about half a dozen claims were made to have detected gravitational waves with this technology, but they were all shot down eventually by the scientific community. That's an important piece of context to the discovery when it did happen because you've got to realize that when these people were thinking they were seeing a gravitational wave in 2015, this was against a background of nearly 50 years of shooting down every single claim that had ever been made to have seen a gravitational wave. And there was a lot of paranoia about and a lot of enmity about because the rest of the physics community generally felt that their money was being wasted by these idiots trying to detect gravitational waves. Uh, I should add that the, I should have said this before, the point about gravitational waves is they're very, very, very difficult to detect. So how are they produced? They're produced by moving masses. So just as electromagnetic waves are produced by moving electrons, my fist here is producing gravitational waves because I'm moving it about. How much? Well, probably about a quantum of energy in the lifetime of a couple of universes. Uh, when Einstein worked out the formula for the emission of gravitational waves uh, in the denominator was uh, a factor of the speed of light to the power four. That just gives you a sense of how uh, difficult to detect these things are. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so half a dozen claims were made and, and the point is that if Joe Weber had been right and he'd really been de detecting gravitational waves, according to the theory, either something very funny would have been, must have been going on, like there was a very local source which we couldn't see, I mean really local, predicting, uh, emitting the waves he was doing, he was seeing. But most people thought the waves ought to be coming from the center of the galaxy if he was seeing them. Um, or either that, or there's so much energy, gen, energy was being produced in gravitational radiation that the Milky Way should have been burning up before our eyes and disappearing. Uh, and people were, were upset by that idea. And so they didn't really want to accept Joe Weber's findings nor any of the subsequent findings. So that's the early technology. Then the technology slowly and gradually moved over to interferometry. Um, an interferometer, uh, who doesn't know what an interferometer is? Hands up. Okay, an interferometer is a device with two arms. There you can see the two arms. Okay, you go from a center station, you shine light down the two arms. The light is reflected back from mirrors at the end and then the reflected light is combined on a screen in the, in the middle. And if you see that, if that light is coherent, you will see um, a pattern of light and dark so-called fringes, light and dark stripes on the screen, okay? And the light and dark stripes are caused by the interference of the two beams of light coming back and meeting each other. They're dark where a trough and a peak coincide and cancel each other out. They're bright where two peaks or two troughs coincide and double the effect. So you get these light and dark troughs. Now, supposing you minutely increase the length of one of the arms, then the position where the light, light say the two, the light and dark troughs will meet each other will be slightly different. 
So what you'll see is that that pattern of fringes move slightly across the screen. And this is an incredibly sensitive instrument. Now I've built one of the, I've built a lot of these actually myself, just a homemade one. And, and you can do it, and I'm going to write another book about gravitational waves in which I'll give you instructions on how to do it. Uh, but it's very, it's pretty easy. Um, mine has arms about, my typical one, has arms about eight inches long. The source of light is a laser pointer. Okay. Uh, the mirrors are just bits of broken shaving mirror. Don't need anything fancy. You need here a beam splitter, which should be something like a semi-silvered mirror, but I've discovered any old bit of glass will do. I just use a bit of glass out of a picture frame from Ikea. And you can produce interference fringes. Not nice, neat, lined up ones, pretty rough ones. But nevertheless, you can see they are interference fringes, light and dark, the light and dark pattern. And you can test this out. So this, this little interfer type of interferometer that I build is made out of a bit of chipboard as a base. And if you get a cup of coffee and put it down on the, on the base, somewhere near one of where one of the beams is, the wood will expand. And you will see the expansion of that wood as a movement of the light and dark patches. And when you take the coffee back, uh, pick your coffee cup up, that expansion will slowly go back again. And you, then you can put your coffee cup on near the other beam and you will see the movement of the fringes in the other direction and back again and so forth. So it's quite a nice, fun instrument to build. Uh, I just did that for myself to help myself be more of a participant in the whole gravitational wave business. So I once took it to a, a physicist, a gravitational wave physicist conference and said, well, do you want to display this? And they sneered at me. So. <laughs> because, of course, their interferometers are somewhat more sensitive. The interferometers used in the detection instrument are, the arms are four kilometers long. Okay, the lasers are extraordinarily powerful and the light doesn't just bounce four kilometers and come back, it bounces backwards and forwards a hundred times before they recombine it and so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. These things are um, probably, I think, no I don't say probably, they are the largest, lar the most sensitive large-scale instruments that have ever been built. Uh, it may be they're the most sensitive instruments that have ever been built but they're certainly the most sensitive large-scale instruments that have ever been built. So that kind of the interferometry took over from about the early 2000s or late 1990s and there was a big war between the people championing the interferometer technology which cost hundreds of millions of dollars and the people championing the resonant bar technology which cost hundred thousand dollars. There was a big war between them and one of the things I document in my earlier books is how this war played out and how they won and what happened. But you know, by now the resonant bars are almost forgotten. Um, those are the two big interferometers in America, one in Hanford in Washington State, one in Livingston, Louisiana, and there you can see the four kilometer arms stretching into the distance and the center station. And it was these instruments that made the discovery. Uh, uh, there are two generations of these instruments. The initial LIGO was built uh, about, well, it was taken down about five or six years ago, and they used the same housings to put in bigger mirrors, more powerful lasers, various other things like this, better suspensions and so on, so that it would work still better. And that was ready for business in the autumn of 2015 to February the 11th. February the 11th was the press conference. Uh, which you may have seen, it was all over all the news bulletins when that gravity waves had been discovered. I was up here in London because they had a little press conference in London. I went to that and uh, down in the basement of the building we went afterwards, we went for a drink and I was doing high fives with the physicists as the announcement came up on the BBC News at six o'clock. Um, this is the very first email keep writing September the 14th, I'm sorry about that. Um, that's the phrase. Hi all, CWB has just put on Grace DB, a very interesting event in the last hour. Okay, um, if you want to find out what all that, all those technical terms mean, you'll have to read the book. It's all explained in <coughs> some detail, but that was it. Um, but 
didn't excite me particularly. I just thought, oh, I'd better save. I see, I've been, I'm always getting, a, for years, been getting dozens of emails a day from the gravitational wave community. Every now and again, I thought, oh, that might be interesting. I'll put them in a separate folder, but mostly I just delete them after reading the subject line. But this one I thought, well, I'll start putting them in, start putting these in their own folder and see how it fades out. Uh, and, you know, a couple of months later, I just reaffirmed that I was not the only person thinking like that. So you can read that quote from a gravitational wave physicist. Now he says, could it have appeared so early in the run? It's because the, the machines weren't officially switched on. They weren't supposed to be officially switched on for a, another few days. This was what, the, what was going on was an engineering run and they were still being shaken down. Uh, as it happens, that was an extraordinarily lucky thing. On the one hand, people were in doubt about it. Well, you know, this shouldn't happen in an engineering run. And are we in a position to make any claim with this, given that it's in an engineering run? Uh, there'll be too much noise, the machine won't be steady enough, people have been messing about with it. But it turned out people hadn't been messing about with it just around the time. And there was just enough sort of period of smooth noise for them to be able to do this, to, to, for there to be enough of that period for them to be able to do the calculations, the statistical calculations they needed to do. So that's the so early in the run. But the, the great advantage of it being so early in the run is that it made it very unlikely that this was a blind injection. Because that's what all the physicists were by this time fed up with. They'd already spent a lot of their lives analysing and investigating blind injections. And they didn't want to have to investigate another blind injection. And they thought, oh no, this is the management shoving in another blind injection to test us again. And nobody knows what to do, because if you're seriously investigating gravitational waves, your life changes. You know, you, you stop talking to your partner and family and seeing your kids. You're working like hell to analyse the data. And it's even worse for me, because I had written two books about blind injections, which was a good thing. Uh, that, that was fine. I was happy about it. But there was no way I was, I was going to write a third about a blind injection. And that meant... If it had been a blind injection, I would have been wasting another three months of my life. Now, I spoke to the director of the project and said, look, this is going to happen. If you, if you put in another blind injection, you better tell me, because I can't spend another, I'm too old to spend another three months of my life messing about with a blind injection. And he kind of, I think we had an understanding that he would. Okay. Um, and then we worked out, how am I going to keep it, the fact that I know secret from everybody else? and I'll pretend that I'm very ill so I can't get on the planes to fly to meetings, which I thought would be necessary at that time. turned out not to be. And we, we sort of had a nod and a wink about that. Uh, but because it happened in this engineering run, most people were ready to believe the directorate when they sent around an email saying, no, this is not a blind injection. I mean, there's a lot of paranoia. There were people who still didn't believe them. They thought, oh, the bastards, they're trying to test us even more, you know. But eventually, people decided, well, there's nothing we can do about this. We've got to get on with the analysis. And I decided, if this turns out to be a blind injection, that's the last I'm going to have to do with LIGO. Okay. But it wasn't a blind injection. And, and I was reassured by the fact, five minutes. Oh, I'm going to take a bit longer than my promised half hour. Okay. Is that all right? So uh, uh, I, uh, it was okay. Then the other thing that people started to do, so you've got this signal. Do you believe it or not? Well, I will tell you that remarkably, and this was completely astonishing given the paranoia that was around, that it only took about two days before people began to believe this is a real signal. Once they dismissed the idea of, you know, they hadn't yet dismissed the idea of blind injection. And the other thing that everybody was worried about is, was it a malicious hack? Was it some clever, malicious people from Google who got into the system and injected something which appeared to be a gravitational wave into the big machines. And one of the big efforts was to work out, well, what would it take to do? Is it credible? 
that somebody could have hacked into it and done this. And the conclusion was, no, it wasn't. It would have required too big a conspiracy and it couldn't be done. And people were reasonably satisfied with that notion. Though the idea of a malicious hack or a hack is still around among the fringe scientists who don't believe this. Um, so that was another thing that was sent a lot, spent a lot of time. And then the analysis starts, you know. The belief, that belief in two days, came because the signal produced a very nice waveform, which very nicely matched the signal from an inspiraling binary pair of black holes. And the waveform overlapped very nicely on the two detectors, the one at Hanford and the one at Livingston, a couple of thousand miles apart. And that got people to believe it. But that's uh, not good enough for the physics community. For the physics community, you have to show that the unlikelihood of this being due to chance is about one in three and a half million. That's the five sigma standard. There's a whole sociological story about how that sigma, how that standard changed in physics from three sigma in about in the 1960s up to five sigma in the, early, in the 2000s, uh, which is also discussed in the book. So uh, that's the signal. That's the figure from the first uh, publication. That's a sort of slightly simpler and more easy to understand version of it, which I got one of the physicists to draw for me. Uh, and um, you can see, oh, you've got to do a few things. So um, that's what the signal from one of these overlapping, sorry, inspiring binary neutron stars ought to look like. Okay. This is more like what it would look like on the machine. You've got to take into account the sensitivity of the machine at various different frequencies. And uh, these are the actual signals from the machine. And they overlap very nicely, as you can see here. OK. And if you take those, that overlapping signal out, this is what you get left. And it looks like noise. Therein lies a story. Does anybody know I'm doing a piece of sociological field work now. Has anybody heard of any recent objections to the validity of this finding by LIGO? Yeah. Anybody else? That's one person. You've heard of it? Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. See, I, I really want to know this. Really, put your hands up high, because I want to count. One, two, three, four, five. OK, five people in a room of 100. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and what they found out, these people who are making the recent objection, is they've analysed this. And they found out that there is an overlapping si signal here. And there is, left over, because when the subtraction was made of this from this, it wasn't done quite right. And so there is, in fact, a bit of overlapping signal here. But for some reason, these objectors have decided that the fact that there's an overlapping signal there means that the original detection can't be trusted. Um, nobody in LIGO thinks this is a, in any way an, a, a reasonable objection. And for what my opinion is worth, I don't think it is either. But it's interesting sociologically um, and bears very nicely on the difference between what you know when you're inside a team and what you know when you're outside a team, because the objectors are outside the team. And you know, they, they, as most people think, don't know how to analyze the signal properly. And that goes back to my little experiment on the narrow crevasse-like nature of science. Um, just uh, the difference between uh, how you come to believe in a signal, which was the overlapping waveforms, and what you have to do to prove it to the wider scientific community. You could read that quotation from one of the gravitational wave physicists. They did a little jiggery pokery with the statistics. It, it was, everybody was agonizing, was this legitimate? Or was, was this statistical massage? Concluded that it wasn't statistical massage. What they did was OK. Uh, and I believe it was OK as well. But you, you see how they were, as a nice thought about it um, from one of my colleagues in the gravitational wave physicists. And you see how people are worried about it. And you see, the reason I'm putting out the quote is you want to see the difference between what makes people believe in something and what makes people th think about what they have to do to convince the wider scientific community. 
The event and its reception, that's what, what was said at the press conference. We have detected gravitational waves. We did it. Uh, what you, nobody knew at the time, and what I was extremely sort of cross about, was that the reason, one of the reasons anyway, that, that the announcement was made with such huge confidence is because by that time they had already seen a second gravitational wave which hit on Boxing Day 2015, December the 26th. But they decided as they hadn't finished fully analysing it, they weren't going to mention it in the discovery paper. I thought this was deceitful and it was falsifying history because the real... There have been cases in physics before where a single event has turned out to be wrong. The most famous one is the magnetic monopole. And the physicists, are, during the course of this whole event, people were saying, oh, let's hope this isn't another magnetic monopole. And then on December the 26th, the boxing day, after a bit, little bit of analysis had been done, it was a great sort of sigh of relief. Thank heaven we found a second one. But that wasn't mentioned in the discovery announcement, which it seemed to me to be completely wrong. The title of the paper, that was the title of the paper, Observation of Gravitational Waves from a Binary Black Hole Merger. And it really did, when I was not in sociological mode, but in scientific mode, send cold shivers down my spine to imagine this would happen after I'd been hanging about for 44 years. This is the event, billion and a half years ago, a billion and a half light years away, two black holes of masses 36 and 29 solar masses collided, losing three suns worth of mass which was totally converted into gravitational wave energy. Compare that three solar suns worth of mass with about a gram for the f uh, converted into energy for the first atomic bomb. Five pounds for the biggest hydrogen bomb that's ever been made. If the energy had, had been emitted as an electromagnetic radiation, it would have been brighter than the full moon, even though it was a billion and a half light years away. Brighter than the full moon for just a fraction of a second. And if it had happened at where our sun was, it would have evaporated the solar system in an instant. But as it was, the energy was emitted as gravitational waves, remember I said how faint it is, faint gravitational radiation is, if you'd been at a distance of our sun from this huge emission of energy, all you would have noticed would have been a slight bang in your ears as your the bones in your ears were moved slightly by the gravitational wave passing by. You wouldn't have noticed it otherwise. Uh, the effect on the four kilometre interferometer arms, changes in the length of one arm as compared to the other, down to one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Small. Which I worked out, and I live in Cardiff, uh, that's Cardiff Bay, taken from what was then my study, Cardiff Bay is about a square mile of water. What you were looking for is a rise in the level of Cardiff Bay, which would have been caused by the addition of one one thousandth of a drop of water. And that's why I said it's the most sensitive instrument that's probably ever been built. Here's the press conferences. Here's the newspaper headlines. There's a song to the tune of I'm a Believer, <laughs> written by some of the physicists. Uh, there's a huge spike in Google Trends, okay, which shows that the whole population has suddenly become fascinated by gravitational waves, but not as fascinated as they are in Kim Kardashian, which I <laughs> checked out at the same time. It's about 2% of Kim Kardashian's peak and completely invisible by Kim Kardashian's average popularity. Okay. A uh, few more things. Uh, how do we know it's true nowadays? Well, we don't. But the way... Uh, discoveries in physics are social changes. And one of the reasons these social changes come about is because you, you know when to stop questioning. There's all kinds of doubts you can still think up. Okay, The whole thing depends on trust and reasonable level of questioning. On the day of the press announcements, this was announced in, in CERN, and I listened to the, um, uh, the recording of the announcement in CERN, and uh, somebody said, how do we know that the gravity waves travel at the speed of light? Because if they don't travel at the speed of light, all bets are off. How do we know they travel at the speed of light? 
the whole observation is consistent with them traveling at the speed of light, but we don't, we've never had any real proof. And somebody put up their hand from the audience and said, look, if you carry on questioning like this, we'll soon have uninvented the Higgs boson. Okay, and that's right. That's the reason you stop questioning, because if you question deeply enough, everything collapses. Undiscover the Higgs. Um, then there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff here with the fringe who were criticizing it. They didn't, the fringe don't believe it. I was in touch with fringe scientists and corresponding with them. Um, and the reason was, well, I'd better stop actually, otherwise we won't have time for questions. We can always come back to these slides if you want, but I'll stop there. We do have time for questions. Please wait for the microphone. Why did you pick gravitational waves community to study? Pure uh, coincidence. Um, I was doing my PhD. I'd already done a study of scientific communication among people building a new kind of laser, the transversely excited atmospheric pressure CO2 laser. I wanted a more competitive field to compare it with. I read about the the controversy in the new scientist, and I thought that'll do me. I picked one or two others as well. And are there, uh, is there a community of sociologists doing equivalent work? Is there, is there someone embedded in the Higgs boson community, for example? Well, there are sociologists going around studying uh, other bits of science. I'm trying to encourage more of this kind of work to be done because I think it's very important that people outside of the technical scientific community have a really deep understanding of science. How much does this observatory cost? And when you take the whole um, scientific budget, the budget allocated for the scientific research, fundamental research, how much how it is uh, um, allocated for this particular device? Okay, well, the whole lot you can say nowadays, by now it's cost about a billion dollars. Um, I don't know how that compares with the scientific budget as a whole. One of the problems for the interferometers was being so expensive. They, they, I should have said they were funded by the National, U.S. National Science Foundation, and it was the biggest experiment the National Science Foundation had ever funded. Uh, now, um, high energy physics is mostly funded by the Department of Energy, and they have a lot more money. So the trouble with gravity waves is it had an impact on the many scientists doing much smaller experiments which, which were funded by the NSF. So it became very unpopular among a large constituency. Um, but uh, when people ask me how much it costs, I always say, well, it's a, probably about the same as the wing of a stealth fighter. <laughs> you know, that, compare it with, with military budgets to put it in perspective, I think. There must be do. the similar ones built all around the world also, right? I heard in India, is, uh, they are building one there. The, yeah. Does the it make sense to yeah. spend that much of money there? Yeah. The Indian one is, is um, the Indian, in India they're now, and it's been a long negotiation over this, they're building uh, the, the um, infrastructure for it, the beam tubes and the foundations and the buildings in India. But the interferometer parts are coming from America because when initial LIGO was built, they built three interferometers within the beam tubes for two, and they're taking the third one, and that's going to India. Why does it make sense? Well, why does the whole thing make sense? Um, it makes sense because it's a fantastic confirmation of Einstein's general theory of relativity, but it also makes sense if you like astronomy because what, where it goes is the foundation of a new gravitational wave astronomy, which enables you to see things that you can't see with electromagnetic astronomy. So you can pretty well look directly at black holes, which can't be seen any other way. So this phenomenon that was discovered, this in-spiraling of two black holes, nobody knew if such things existed. So there were two discoveries, the first discovery of gravitational waves and the first discovery of in-spiraling binary black holes. Why do we need another one in India? Well. What the ideal is, is to move this astronomy along so that you can see a gravitational wave and compare its position in the sky, look at its position in the sky with electromagnetic telescopes, 
And for that reason, you've got to know its position in the sky. And the only way to know its position in the sky is per, by triangulation of the time of arrival of the event on widely separated instruments. At the moment, with only two instruments, you get a huge area on the sky where it could have come from. There's a third one actually in Italy, which is just coming online. And then with the Indian one, there'll be four fairly widely separated. And you may be able to narrow down the position of the, on, in the sky more narrowly then. And then your gravitational astronomy will get better and better. Um, with hindsight, we can certainly tell that uh, the first 40 years of uh, inferometers uh, were clearly not sensitive enough. Was well, it's not 40 years of interferometers, 40 years of, 40 40 years years of instruments. 40 years of detectors, yeah. yeah. Um, was there any acknowledgement at the time that this might be the case? Um, yeah. I mean, Joe Weber, who I interviewed in 72, told me that when he built this apparatus, he didn't expect to see anything because everybody knew it was, it was not sensitive enough by a factor of, a, you know, a thousand million. Uh, and... Uh, the question is, what do you do when you, make, you appear to make a discovery which ought to be impossible? Do you say, oh, forget about it, it's theoretically impossible, or do you say, well, maybe we need to think, rethink our theories through? And a lot of people did start rethinking their theories and find ways to make Joe Weber's findings compatible with theory, like focusing of gravitational waves by some curious <laughs> mechanism. So there's a dilemma there. And that dilemma was played out among the people who put experiment first and the people who put theory first. So everybody knew that in theory, at least in the initial theory, these instruments were far too insensitive to see anything. But the determined experimentalists still felt, well, if I've seen something, I'm going to report it. Do you see any um, sociological parallels between the whole field of gravitational waves and uh, people kind of on coming on both sides of it to climate science? Oh yes. Um, the uh, as I said, I did my first lot of interviews in 1972, and then another lot of interviews in 75. Uh, well, in 72, I, in 72, in 1974. I wrote the paper that emerged out of the 1972 fieldwork. And the big claim in that paper, the reason I got a university, secure university job and had a stellar career subsequently, was the, the observation I made that there was something called the experimenter's regress. And the experimenter's regress goes like this. Uh, scientists say, well, if you want to know whether something's true or not, you have to replicate it. And I think that's correct. But the trouble is, how do you know whether you've replicated something or not? So the people who copied Joe Weber's experiment, or roughly copied it, said, look, we've built an apparatus like yours, Joe, and we don't see anything. And Joe Weber said to them, that's because you haven't built it right. And that's a, not an unreasonable claim, because doing an experiment is very, 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 very difficult. Think back to the experiments you did at school. They never worked, mostly, OK? You had to be told by the school teacher that they weren't working and you had to keep on repeating them until you got them to work. And this is what Joe Weber said the other people needed to be doing. Yeah. So what happens is if you look at what happened in 72 and for a few years afterwards, the argument turned from has this been repeated to who's competent to repeat it? Who's the most competent experimenter? Is it Joe Weber? or is it his rivals? And then when you get this idea, you see it happens all the time. Cold fusion, climate change, yes. You can put this template onto climate change and it works very well. I mean, the next problem you have, having done all that, is to say, well, how do we come down on the right side of climate change? And I've had, been involved in a, in a huge row since the early 2000s with my colleagues because we put forward a view that we have to shift our attention in social studies of science from how do you reach the truth to how do you decide who's an expert. And you should always listen to the experts whether they're right or wrong because otherwise your society is going to collapse and you're going to have a dystopia. 
and fortunately my friend Donald Trump has come along to help my views get salience. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I was just curious, you, you mentioned before about how um, black holes can't be observed you know, any other way um, except gravitational waves. So yeah. how, how did they know when they observed these gravitational waves that they were two black holes rotating? Is it because um, they had a theoretical model of what the gravitational waves would look like and this kind of matched it? Or was there some other way that they, they knew these black holes were there? Uh, no, uh, it's a good question. Um, so two things, yeah. Firstly, you've got the, this model, which took years and years and decades to work out, which did match it. But then at the time, people were saying, but maybe they're not black holes, maybe they're boson stars. Boson stars weigh about the same as black holes. Okay. Uh, and, but who's ever seen a boson star? We've seen it even less than a black hole. This is just a figment of theoretical physicist's imagination. You can imagine anything. And I'm tearing out my hair saying, oh, no, not boson stars. We don't want boson stars. For heaven's sake, let's have a discovery at last. I want to die having reported a discovery. And the boson star sort of thing faded away. But it's one of those things you could still ask. You could still ask, has it really been black holes? And people could still argue, no, it's boson stars. It's one of those places where you say, time to stop questioning, guys, OK? And then there was another nice little argument produced for why they had to be black holes. Uh, they could tell how far apart these things were just before they collided from the speed of rotation. Uh, and they knew how much they weighed also from that kind of thing. And you could work out that nothing that wasn't very compact could get that close without touching. And that was another argument for them being black holes. So it's a good question because the argument is still not completely settled. Uh, but it's settled if you're a physicist and you want to be called kind of reasonably sane. Um, have you now finished with the gravitational wave community or what are you going to do next? I don't know if anything else is still going well, on that you're studying. Well, it's a very good question again because I thought I'd finished. Uh, I'd decided that this was the time to finish. Nothing as exciting as this is ever going to happen to me in my life studying, again, in my life studying physicist. And I've kind of corralled somebody else to carry on after me looking at uh, gravitational wave physics and continuing to write the detailed history of it because I don't want it to stop suddenly. But this business about these guys objecting to it is really interesting from a sociological point of view. So I found myself getting sucked into it again and I'll probably write a bit more about it before I do completely finish. We are unfortunately out of time. We have one time for one more question. Oh, hopefully a quick question then. Um, so if expertise is very narrow, going back to your chart at the beginning, but we should identify the experts and believe them right or wrong, is, do those two things make life difficult when you put them together? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, there's another whole element of which experts you believe in. You, you also have to believe only in decent, honest experts, and there's plenty of non-decent, dishonest experts around, but you need a different kind of argument, I mean, a different kind of investigative technique to find out who those, those are. I mean, the, the incident that I always use as um, my touchstone in how to think about these things is the mumps, measles, and rubella vaccination controversy. And uh, this is one of the things that got me started in sort of being hated by lots of people in social studies of science because I noticed that many of my colleagues in the field wanted to defend the parents' right not to vaccinate their children during the course of the mumps, measles, rubella controversy. And my view was that that was terrible and that in fact the parents had to vaccinate their children. And the reason is if you, if you look at what uh, Andrew Wakefield, the person who started the whole controversy, said, if you look at his paper in The Lancet, I was reading it just the other day actually, he had no evidence at all that mumps, measles and rubella vaccine were linked to autism. There's lots of allusions and asides in that original paper, but the paper says we haven't proved it, and he certainly hadn't proved it. 
And if you allow a panic like this to arise, it was very much uh, amplified by the press, who have a view that they should always tell a balanced story. Well, their balanced story was about, on the one side were parents, poor things, who'd seen their children become autistic a little while after receiving the MMR vaccine. And the other side of the balance was the huge epidemiological studies which showed that nowhere where MMR vaccine had been introduced into countries was there any increase in the incidence of MMR in the population. And the latter thing is the end of the story. The parents were always going to see some children going, becoming autistic after they'd been injected with MMR because both things happen at about the same age. Okay, and there would be an equal number of children who nobody would be talking about who would, have who would have received the MMR just after becoming autistic, but nobody was talking about them. So all this balancing in the newspapers and so on was wrong. And one of the arguments that really infuriated me by one of my colleagues was, well, look, there might be, a, there is a possibility that some small subsection of children who are peculiarly vulnerable in some way, were affected by the MMR vaccine. The epidemiological statistics are too large scale to deal with that. And of course he was absolutely right, but you could make exactly the same argument for whether people became autistic just after they'd eaten a kiwi fruit for the first time, or anything else you like. So if you allow this kind of non-expert inference from observational statistics to enter the public domain, you can waste all your National Health Service money on scares and never get anywhere. I mean, the whole argument is always carried out under the constraint of scarcity. And so it's, n it's not a question of what's absolutely right in the long term. It probably is the case that one or two kids are vulnerable to MMR, but it's no good saying it. It, it doesn't get you to the policy answer. So that's my answer to your question. So, d so it does that answer your question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Harry Collins.